Hey team, you're about to experience my interview with Ellie Finkelstein from Constructor. Constructor is a search and product discovery platform designed for complex omnichannel and B2B merchants. Constructor was also featured in the Forrester Way for commerce search and product discovery platforms for Q3 of 2023. I had a fantastic conversation with Ellie about all the com complex subtleties of providing search and merchandising for complex B2B merchants. I really enjoyed my conversation with him and I think you will too. Welcome to B2B Commerce Corner. Commerce Corner is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast discussing all things B2B commerce through the lens of agencies, consultants, merchants, and more. Enjoy. Let's Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the podcast. It is my pleasure to welcome Ellie Finkelstein from Constructor to the podcast. Welcome, Ellie. Thank you so much for having me. It's good it's to be here. May is so cool to have you along for the ride today. I hadn't heard of you guys before until I looked up who I was going to be B two B online Florida with, who was going to be speaking there, who was going to be presenting, and I was like, man, there's such a cool group uh, and cohort of people that are going to be attending this event. And I was like, man, I need to try to get as many of these people on the podcast before we turn up there together as I can. And uh, your name came across my desk and I was like, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to take a punt. I'm going to see if he's available. And you've made yourself available to talk to me today. So I super appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I was excited when you reached out. I'm, I'm a big fan of the podcast. I feel like I learned quite a bit when I listened to it. So hopefully I won't stop other people from learning by being here. Uh, no, May, I think you have got a pretty cool bit of kit on your hands there and we'll talk about that in depth but before we jump straight in the deep end of the technology maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you even came to be in the e-commerce space i know you can't you come from a, a a data science background you come from a computer science background you come from a linguistics background so you know it, it feels like you've got all the tools in the toolkit to be doing what you're doing but what attracted you to e -com? I first started in the e-commerce search world at a company called Shutterstock. This was back in like 2012, I'm 11, something like that. The thing that got me really excited about it is my background, like you said, it was linguistics and data science. So my master's in computational linguistics. I was looking for a place where I could use that. And the really cool thing about search is I think some of the most interesting problems in both computational linguistics. And then on the e-commerce side, some of the most interesting problems in, in psychology exist there. So it's like, you're not just looking for things that are strictly relevant, which I think is how people traditionally view this stuff. You're looking for things that are actually attractive to people that people actually want to buy. And then you're looking for ways of presenting them in, that are attractive people to people and make them want to buy. And so that's both linguistic understanding, like what does somebody actually mean? But then also psychological, like understanding like, based on somebody's behavior, what are they likely to buy based off of how you present it? Like, how do you make it most appealing to them? And I just, I thought this was fascinating. As I was thinking of starting a company, I was thinking, what's something that I could work on for 20 years and never get bored? And e-commerce plus surge felt like that place. Anybody who has used Shopify for any length of time at all knows just how incredible it is for B2C and D2C merchants. However, it leaves a lot to be desired for B2B merchants and brands. That's where Wholesale Gorilla comes in. Wholesale Gorilla is a Shopify app that adds tons of essential B2B commerce functionality right on top of Shopify. It allows you to run and get started with all of your wholesale functionality that you need to run your B2B and wholesale business online, all within the safety of the Shopify ecosystem and you can use Wholesale Gorilla with any tier of Shopify plan. You do not need to be using Shopify Plus. We've partnered with Wholesale Gorilla and they are offering 50% off your first paid month when you use the coupon code EDGE. We want to thank them for their support of the podcast and go and check out Wholesale Gorilla today. Wow, that, that's an amazing backstory. And... What sort of, when you started to look at this field and you started to go, man, I think that this sort of joins together both my skill set as well as a passion that I think I can really 
run with here. And, and clearly it's a passion because you've been doing this for nearly nine years already now, which is just crazy because that's such a long time in our industry. It feels like an eon in our industry. So you've been at this long before the buzzwords of AI and machine learning became a real big thing and they became tacked on to every single piece of technology in the marketplace. And so you, you have been at this for, for a really long time now and unpicking the, the deep challenges in our space. In many respects, search and merch and I guess product recommendations, et cetera, have become commoditized. And there's so many platforms out there now. There's so much competition out there now. Now, nine years ago, there probably wasn't as much competition, but there already were some pretty big names. There, there was already some competition. There's more now. You've got the Algolias of the world. You've got the Bloom Reaches of the world. You've got so many competitors in the space. Did that give you pause at all before jumping in? Or did you say, look, actually, with my background and my experience, I'm going to be able to create something novel and unique that's going to give merchants an edge that they can't get anywhere else. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely gave me pause. I think it would be very arrogant of me to look at the market and there were, I think, 26 other players and to be like, I'm definitely smarter than all of them. Like when both my co-founder and I were starting, we were looking at this and we we're like, this would be an interesting problem, but it doesn't make sense to have a 26 vendor unless we can offer something special to the market. And when we were looking at it, my, my co-founder, who's also from the same company that I used to work at, Shutterstock, so he was the former CTO over there. We were discussing it. It was like the way that everybody else had been approaching search, it was in a one-size-fits-all kind of way. So they weren't building something that was particular to e-commerce. What they were building instead was they were either working on top of an open source solution that was meant for all search use cases under the sun, or they were building directly a one-size-fits-all solution that works for everybody under the sun. If you look at most search vendors, this was true back then, it's still true now. They're either built on top of Elasticsearch or they're built on top of Solar, which are one-size-fits-all solutions. Or without calling out names of competitors, some of the ones that you mentioned, they built it from scratch, but also like it's not e-commerce focused. And when we were looking at that, we were like, e-commerce, it's different. The reason that it's different is when you're looking at the problem of search and product discovery generally, like optimizing for relevance, just results that look, look relevant makes sense. When you're looking at e-commerce though, if I give you back a bunch of things that look relevant to the naked eye, but you don't buy, that's not success. There's something else that you really care about. And, and we saw this even when we were working on it at Shutterstock. Like I remember I was having conversations with folks on the e-commerce side of it, where I was talking about some of the metrics that we cared about on the engineering side. And I was like, we're making it go faster. Is that important to you? Be like, yeah, that's great. And be like, okay, cool. What if it went faster, but you lost revenue? Like people bought less. Would you still be happy? They're like, no, absolutely not. Like, okay, cool. So the thing is not speed. Like speed is not the most important thing. here. What about relevance? If we used in one of our esoteric relevance metrics, and there's a bunch of these on the computer science side. NDCG is an example. We, we make something increase in, in NDCG. We make it look more relevant. Would you be happy? Yeah, that's great. That's cool. What if conversion rate and revenue went down because of that? Would you still be here? No, not at all. That'd be terrible. Okay, cool. So those are all means to an end. And what everybody else is doing is they're solving for those means to an end. And they're hoping that like the revenue, the conversions, the things that they actually care about, the great shopper experience comes along for the ride. And that just didn't always happen because those mean that didn't always equal the ends. And so that was the big differentiating thing for us. We were like, e-commerce is different. It's really an AI problem where you should really be looking at the click stream, the user behavior, how people interact with it. And you should really be solving for a business metric. So don't solve for relevance. Don't solve for speed. Like those are nice to have. So they should come along for the ride. But fundamentally, the thing that you should be solving for is, are you showing shoppers things that they want to buy? And if you are, then you're doing a good job. And if you're not, then you're not. It doesn't matter how relevant, like I think it looks or how relevant somebody else thinks it looks. And when we realized that nobody else was doing that, and fundamentally the way that people were built, they weren't built to do that either. So it wasn't something that they could easily switch to either. That's what we realized. Okay, if we can, if we've got a hypothesis. If we can prove out a hypothesis, if we can run EV tests and show that this actually does lead to more shopper happiness, this actually does lead to more revenue, more conversions then it makes sense to have business here. And when you first launched, were you as comprehensive of a platform 
as no. you are today, because you've got like six separate modules. And what I have witnessed, and I'd love your take on this, what I have witnessed is a slow coming together or merging of multiple different supporting e-commerce technologies over time. Back in the day, really early days of search and merge and, and when we had SLI systems and we had some of the really early technology going back more than older than your technology even, we had a scenario where most of the major players, they either did, they did merchandising, they did product recommendations, yeah. they, did, they did quiz commerce, and they did all these things quite independently of each other. Now, the challenge in that environment is that these things are all intertwined in throughout and mixed throughout the customer journey. And then we've got things like we, we have product uh, comparison engines, we've got wish list engines, we've got all these sources of data that really need to come together in a unique way to be able to personalize that journey on the front end. And so when you've only got one module, let's say you've only got the search module, you need to know what categories they've visited. You need to know which product pages they visited. You need to know what they've added to their cart. You need to know what they've bought. There's, there's so much data that you really need to have from a behavioral perspective to really start crafting a personalized experience. It, it feels like all of these technologies, including yours, have had to, by definition, become more all-encompassing over time. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. In, in terms of where I think things are going, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. And I think this is something that people missed in, in, in the olden days. It's at the end of the day, one connected customer experience. So ideally, like the system that you have powering that entire experience, all parts of it are talking to each other. Like I think to your point from a second ago, from reading between the lines, it's like if somebody interacts in a certain way when they're searching, does that inform what recommendations you should show them? Yes, absolutely. When someone's interacting with those recommendations or they scroll right past them, does that inform what products you should show them when they go to a category page? Yes, absolutely. If they go through a quiz, I think you mentioned this as well. I think it's like one of the best examples. They're literally giving you zero party data there. They're giving you, they're telling you explicitly, they're answering explicit questions. Do you like organic food or not? On the B2B side, do you have a particular set of brands that you're willing to buy from or not buy from? If they give you that information there and then you let it die, like you don't use it for all other parts of product discovery, like you're, you're leaving value on the table. It's a bad experience for the customer and it's a bad experience for the retailer. I mean, for the e-commerce site. To answer your original question, though, like it's not when we started. I'm, I'm not a very good marketer or salesperson or go-to-market teams. I think have some trouble with me on that side. I was not sure that, that this stuff would work originally. I, at the end of the day, I think of most things as hypotheses, experiments, and you, you get a cool conclusion from that. We started only on auto-suggest. That was our first product. That was all that we did when we first started. And the idea for that was let's try to prove things out there. It was the easiest, smallest thing that we could build using this system of trying to rely on the behavioral data instead of and trying to solve for attractiveness instead of relevance. And we saw success there. Like we, we ran some A-B tests, even when it was a very small company, there were only three of us. We, we ran A-B tests on some larger retailers. One of them, did, it no longer exists. It was a company called Jed.com, took a, took a chance on us. And when we saw that we could actually increase revenue in much more than what they were paying us, like this was consistently 10x ROI, that's where we were like, we've got a real business here. The evolution from there was, I'm a big fan of doing one thing focusing on it and doing it very well. It's just a question of what that one thing should be, like where does that one thing end? And it turned out after thinking about it and realizing that really it's all one connected customer journey. Like the one thing shouldn't just be auto-suggest, it shouldn't just be search, it should be product discovery because they're all connected. And I think what you speak to here also speaks the language of merchants in the sense that in the bad old days, I like to think of them as the bad old days, it was a very heavy and very expensive and very complex exercise to tie all of these pieces of functionality together to get them to share data with one another. So let's say you had a product rec engine. Let's say you had a quiz commerce engine. Let's say you had a search, a site search platform. Let's say you had a merchandising platform. 
And, and I, I distinctly remember that some merchants back in the day would have three or four completely separate and disparate pieces of technology. Sure, they all had APIs, but the middleware that you had to create for them to share data with each other, and, and nine times out of 10, they had no native integrations with each other because they saw each other as competitors, uh, or at least they, they saw each other as eventual competitors. And so they were like, we're not going to help. We're not going to help one of our competitors get, get better of us by allowing easy integration. You're going to have to go and build that custom yourself. And so much like the CDPs of today, it feels this merging of technologies had to happen because only the very largest of brands back in the day had the resources, capability, and even the technical nows to be able to scope tying all of these pieces of data together into one unified experience. Whereas now it feels platforms like yours and other competitors in the space really are creating a one-stop shop for product discovery and personalized experiences that mean we don't have to do this crazy somersault integration effort that takes us nine months and a hundred thousand dollars to tie it all together now this is all inside the one platform yeah it's there's an interesting reason for this at least like for my own research i think that a lot of this and we experienced this as well when we were a younger company a lot of the reason for why other companies before us, they would largely focus on maybe just search or just recommendations, but across all industries, is that's what VC venture capitalists would push them to do. And we got pushed in the exact same direction. Like our vision was we want to focus on just one industry, like e-commerce, that's it. Because it's a different problem than everywhere else. And we had a lot of trouble raising money for that because VCs would consistently tell us the total addressable market is not big enough. So like when I'm looking at our competitors and I see that like they do e-commerce, then they do everything else under the sun. I'm like, I know exactly why. Like we got pushed in that exact same direction. We, we needed to go profitable for a little while because we had so much trouble raising money on just the e-commerce. These, and that was true up until around the time that COVID hit. And then everyone was like, oh, actually e-commerce is a really big market and it's fine. Absolutely love that. and. For you guys, did you, was this all in-house tech that you built yourselves or did you, through acquisition, you said, hey, we don't want to build every component from scratch. So we're going to acquire somebody and we're going to roll that, and we're going to roll our own from there. Or did you build sequentially each module out in-house from scratch? Yeah. So for us, we didn't build every single piece from scratch. We didn't acquire anything. The reason for that, I think companies should focus on what they're good at. My background is engineering and, and product. And so it was like, I know that I'm not going to be the best salesperson in the world. I know that I'm not going to be the best marketer in the world, but like, I can build a good product. And so that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on building the best product. And that works perfect in a PLG environment, like what we just really had rocket fuel poured on. As you say, during COVID, it was like, okay, now we know, okay, we need these five features and functionalities. Otherwise, we're just not going to be competitive in the e-commerce space. And all of a sudden, if you can become that one-stop shop, then I think you become almost a default choice in many respects in your specific niche, but you've gone one step further. And that is the fact that you have taken on the very meaty, chunky challenge of also supporting B2B e-commerce merchants. And this is something that something like 90 plus percent, maybe even 95 percent of the search and merch technologies that are out there in the marketplace, they just don't touch. They have no intention to touch. They don't even talk about it in their marketing or in their product. They pitch themselves 100% at D2C and B2C merchants because they feel like that's a space they can win and it's a little bit simpler. But mm -hmm. all of a sudden, when you start taking on B2B merchants, they have a whole new and unique set of challenges beyond mm -hmm. what D2C merchants have. And they have a whole new layer and level of complexity in their business and in their sales process and, and in even the way the accounts themselves are structured that log into an e-commerce site, it's completely different. And exactly. so maybe you can speak to, I, I'm guessing similar to how you added modules over time, that maybe you started out with a focus on D2C and, and B2C and then laterally, I'm guessing you had to really try to think about, okay, do we really want to bite this piece off of, of B2B knowing just how complex it is because it adds a lot of complexity to the product you're trying to build too. That's absolutely right. We had a lot of questions about whether it made sense to do B2B before we started doing it for exactly the reasons that, that you're mentioning. 
as we were researching it, it's this is very different from B to C from D to C. The reason that we wound up doing it is it was based on I since again, we had some customers that had a B to C and B to B business. And we started off on the B2C side and then they said, can you do the B2B side as well? And we're like, maybe, let's talk about it. One of the things that we were especially not sure about is whether the same sort of personalization would be valuable on the B2B side as, as it is on the B2C side and whether we could drive the same sort of revenue with on the B2B side. Because it's with B2B, and you know this better than I do, but with a lot of these situations, it's, you have your standard thing that you're buying like 5,000 units up and you buy that every time if I can show the results. And then on the flip side, like in terms of the technical challenges, you often have situations where you have separate accounts that can buy and they have access to different sets of products. You might be willing to sell one thing to McDonald's, but not sell that same thing to Burger King or vice versa. And then on top of that, even if you are willing to sell the same thing to both of them, maybe it's a different price. Maybe one of them negotiated one price with you, maybe one of them negotiated another price with you. And so this sort of stuff, you know, balloons the complexity of the challenge. You also have a lot of the time massively larger data sets than you do on the B2C side. So a 70 million product catalog, if you're looking at a brand or something like that's never going to happen. But on the B2B side, that's common. It's not at all weird. And as we were looking at all of these challenges, we're like, does this make sense? And the first thing that we realized is that the system could handle this sort of complexity. Like we, I guess a lot of this is coming from, we were both at this company a long time ago called Shutterstock. It's stock photography and it also had a massive catalog. And so we were by luck used to handling situations with massive catalogs with a lot of dirty data and a lot of complexity. And then on the flip side of it, in terms of can we actually lift revenue more, which is our, our mantra, can we lift a business revenue, a business KPI for you? This was surprising for me, but it turned out for the A-B tests that we started to run in B2B, we would win those by more than we would win the ones in B2C, which I was not expecting at all. It looks like the reason, and again, this is still in hypothesis stage, I think. I would want to see more of these to really be sure, but... What it looks like is happening is you often have these massive catalogs and because the catalogs are so big, there's a lot that the B2B site might sell that a customer might not realize that they sell. And all of a sudden you start to add in personalization and you start to add in ranking based on attractiveness instead of relevance, like what's going to be most attractive for that customer. And you start to show them things that maybe they weren't buying from you before. They were buying it from somebody else. They just didn't know that you had it. And now you start showing them those things. And the level of personalization that you can do on a B2B site, like this is another thing that was surprising, to me, but it's much greater than what you can do on a B2C site. So they, 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 the reason for it is, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I, just, I get excited about this. The reason to it, it was fascinating for me. It's like when you look at the average user that, that comes to a B2C site, that might be the first time that you see them, call it like 60, 70% of the time. That's not atypical. And somebody that you see again, it's often like three months, six months, a year after you saw them the last time. Right? Like people often aren't buying a new TV every day. They're not buying new pants every day. B2B side though, like you have this really interesting phenomenon where they're coming first very regularly to buy. And then on the flip side of it, basically everybody is logged in. So you know who they are. And then finally, and probably most attractively for the personalization, it re you've got this extra level that comes from which account, which company somebody works at. Let's say on the B2C side, let's say theoretically you and I both work at the same company. Does that tell you anything about the sort of clothes that we wear? No, like we wear absolutely different clothes. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if we both work at the same company. But if let's say that you and I work in the same company and they need to buy products from, from, from B2B, I might be a completely new employee. Does it tell you anything about what I'm going to buy that I work for the same company as Jason? Absolutely. Like all of those accounts, still all of those prearranged deals that, that we have about what can be bought, those still exist for me the same way. So you can personalize on that account level in a way that you can't do at all on the B2C side. So I think that all of those things combined, at least from what we've seen and like the thing that we know for sure is that we win these A-B tests. Why we win them is more of the, I'm trying to dig in after the fact. But I'd be massively surprised if those reasons don't contribute. Because you look especially at the users that buy the most, those are where we win the most. 
It's the users that come back very regularly. We call them whale accounts. Those are where we always see the biggest wins. That makes sense because you are able to aggregate the most data about those types of customers. And so they've got a, a much longer buying history, much greater transactional history. They perhaps have shared shopping lists at the organization level. So it becomes even more clear the types of things that they routinely buy. And for example, matching attributes of other products that may be similar to those types of products that they don't know that you carry yet again, then obviously you can present those to them. But as you pointed out, the areas where it starts to get thorny are needing to present more data, or in some cases, less data in the B2B realm than in the B2C realm. And so we're talking about hidden categories, hidden products, unique tiered pricing. We're talking about MOQ presentation on the product card that you don't need to think about in the B2C world. We're, we're talking currencies, we're talking tax rates, we're talking the, the amount of complexity involved in the B2B space is pretty intense. When you start drilling down into all the areas where you need to present products and you might be presenting products on a homepage, on a category page, obviously on a product page, in the cart, at checkout, there's so many areas that are impacted that you guys touch that all of a sudden now you've got to think through every single B2B use case to make sure that the experience is consistent throughout the user journey and so that they don't see things they're not supposed to see. They don't see categories they're not supposed to see. They don't see search results they're not supposed to see. It all of a sudden starts, the complexity factor is significant in B2B. And so when you took this on, did you guys realize, geez, okay, we think we're gonna get some really, or we're gonna drive some amazing value in this space for merchants, but it's gonna be a big engineering lift to cover. Cause you can't, cause unfortunately you can't just cover one of those use cases. If you're gonna roll it out across your suite of products and your suite of modules, you have to roll it out in a big bang fashion. You can't say, okay, in search results, we're gonna do B2B, but in product recs, we won't. It has to respect all of those account-based rules right across every module, right? Otherwise it doesn't work. So it's a yeah. pretty big engineering lift to retrofit your entire technology to support B2B use cases. Absolutely. So I think that this might be something that, that you and I have in common and I probably don't have in common with most engineers. I really talk into customers. I'm not the sort of person where it's, I'm in the shower and I come up with an idea and I'm like, without talking to anybody, we got to build that because it's the best thing that's like bread. I, I don't trust myself. I, I trust our customers. So I spend a good deal of my time talking to our customers and that's exactly what we were doing, what, what I was doing before we went all in with B2B. It was especially going to those folks that had the B2C business plus the B2B business and then just trying to talk to as many people as I could who were just doing B2B straight up and figuring out what all would we need to do? Where, where do you see the complexity in your business? What makes you worried about somebody who started off on the B2C side? And after doing that and cataloging all these different, we need to handle these larger catalogs and we need to handle availability of multiple accounts and blah, blah, blah. It was like, okay, can we do all of that? And how much of a lift would it be to do all of that? And then there's definitely things that, that we're going to miss up front that we're going to need to commit to building as they come up. And can we commit to building that? And do we have the resources? Do we have the engineers? And are we willing to make that promise to our customers? And the answer at the end of the day was yes. And the way that we judge ourselves with this is if we ever have a customer that, that signs and they don't wind up going live or they wind up churning, then we know that we did something terribly wrong. And the nice thing, at least so far, is nobody's done that. We've had customers that go out of business. We've had a customer that left overpriced, but our churn rate, at least as far as I know, is the lowest in the industry. And the reason is that we have a very specific focus. We only focus on larger e-commerce companies and we make sure beforehand, we've got like a thing called a proof schedule. It basically makes it, makes certain that it works for them. And then if there's any part that they need that's missing, that's not on them for not calling it out during the RFP, that's on us. And we've got to figure out a way to make it work for them because they put a ton of trust into us. They're spending a lot of money on us. They're spending a lot of money on integration. That, that trust is sacred. We've got to make it work for them. And you, you raise a good point, which is, do you have, quote unquote, out of the box integrations, like kind of one click, single click app integrations with any platform out there? Or is your implementation typically a fully custom implementation every time, even if they're using an off the shelf platform like a big commerce or a VTEX or a 
Shopify, is it, is, is it a pretty much a custom implementation that's required at the level that you're at? Back in the day, the simple search modules were pretty easy to drop in with a bit of JavaScript and maybe a sync of the catalog. And that was pretty much all that was required. And then you could do your magic from there. But it feels like with the comprehensiveness of your platform, it's going to be a custom lift. It's going to be a custom integration. So it's, it's a great question. We think of this in both ways. So the first one is the integration should be possible to do regardless of, of what e-commerce platform you're on. Like it should be possible to do without a connector. And those were all of our first integrations. We did them all without connectors. So like it was primarily API based and we still support that. If people want to use it, we still very much recommend it. But one of the advantages to focusing just on e-commerce and, and just on larger e-commerce companies is that you wind up running into the same partners pretty regularly. And it's a limited set of partners because we've got a much smaller purview than our competitors. We're not trying to integrate with everything under the sun. It's just like the big commerce is just the sales force is just the commerce tools of the world. So at this point, like if somebody is on one of the major e-commerce platforms, we would recommend that they use one of our connectors. And because we see those so regularly and We've got very much like a hand-holding white glove approach to this. And you know, with every single customer that uses these, we're constantly asking for feedback. Like, where did you see challenges? What was difficult about this? And constantly iterating based off of that. I'm very proud of our connectors. And I think if somebody's on one of the major e-commerce platforms or uh, one of the major PIMs, I, I recommend that they use a connector. They don't have to, but they'll just go faster and it'll be easier for them if they do. And how did you guys handle the initial seeding of the market. Now, most platforms like yours, they would prefer to be partner delivered, meaning you've got agencies that already own the relationship with the customer and are doing the rest of the build. And so therefore they would own the integration of your technology in. But when you're new, you don't necessarily have a proven product. You don't necessarily have partners that you can reach out to that have implemented your technology before. And so therefore most platforms like yours get stuck in, at least in the beginning, doing all the implementations themselves, which means that it almost turns you into a, an agency as well as a product company. And that's not where you want to stay, obviously, <laughs> but in order to seed the market, you've got no choice. You've you got to say, look, we're going to own this implementation. We'll work with your existing agency partner, sure, in terms of being able to get into their version control systems, their deployment cadences, et cetera. We'll work with them, but we need to own this integration with the theme to be able to surface all of our experiences through the front end but then usually most platforms like yours want to get to a partner delivery approach as soon as possible, because in my experience, most product companies make terrible professional services companies and vice versa. And so it's always better to have product companies focusing on product wherever possible. It's a catch 22, right? You have to get enough deployments in market to prove yourself. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly right. So on, on the one hand, there's a lot of pain that, that you feel from trying to integrate this stuff yourself. And I, I don't think that we should be a professional services company. Like we don't have a professional services arm. I, I highly recommend that the people use our systems integrator partners for that. Or reach out to me if you want any recommendations. But I also think that especially in the early days, it was very valuable for us to go through that experience still because it lets us feel the pain that those systems integrators would ideally later not feel because we went through it first and we were like, oh, this part of the system could be better. That part of the system could be easier to use. There's no, at least in my opinion, there, there's no substitute for dog fooding for, I guess there's probably a better term for that, but for basically like doing it yourself, walking through it yourself in order to feel the same pain, understand the pain that people are going to walk through it at afterwards. Yeah, all the areas that you get burnt as a product company trying to do implementations are the areas that your SIs are going to get burnt on when they take your platform on and build a practice around it. So the reality is that if you can minimize the burn marks as early as possible, then everybody's a winner. That's my opinion on it. And we still do that for what it's worth. We don't do our own integrations anymore. I wouldn't recommend using us for, to integrate your product, but we do still point that we are very religious about is every single customer that signs up with Constructor has easy access, not just via email, but also via direct message, whether it's Slack or Teams or whatever to every single person within Constructor. And the reason we do that is so that if they're feeling pain, we hear about that pain. I want people to be able to have access to me if they want to have access to every C-level person within the company easily, because I want to hear about the pain. 
if I'm hearing about too much pain, that means we screwed up somewhere. That's not like a, let's move to a ticketing system or something like that. That'll just drown out the actual problem. What I'd much rather have is I'll feel the pain too. I'll have some not great weeks as we're trying to get through it. But at the end of the day, we'll have a better product. Absolutely. And obfuscating the pain might work for you guys, but it certainly doesn't work for the customer. The closer you can get to the pain, the better off you'll be in, the better off your size will be as, as well at the end of the day. And when we think about the timeline for implementation of your platform, most search and merge technologies that I've seen, they sit around that 12 week mark is pretty common. It's a three month from woe to go, from scoping to implementation by the SI with support by the vendor like yourselves. Is that pretty true of you guys as well? You, you sit around that maybe three to four month mark would be a typical, because obviously you're dealing with large, complex merchants with large, complex needs and custom requirements unique to their business. So is that, would that be pretty common for you guys around that 12 to maybe 16 week mark? So our, our average at this point, and we track this, it's uh, seven weeks, but it, it does depend on the customer. It depends on how many resources they have. It, it depends on how serious they are about getting this implemented quickly. But we try to keep that average as low as possible. The connectors that we were talking about before is, is one example of how you can get that average much lower than, than otherwise. The difference between creating your own integration that sends your entire catalog to constructor versus just pulling it out of a system of record that you'll already have, it's not small. Of course, yeah, it's almost like a playbook. It's a design pattern that you know works and is repeatable, so makes complete sense. And if you were to think about what your customers are asking for today that perhaps you don't do, or if you're looking out over, say, the next 12-month window, is there anything you yourselves say, hey, we don't do this today, but we want to and we should own this piece? Is there anything significant on your roadmap that you're in a position to be able to share that you say, look, we want to change the game again. We want to disrupt ourselves and we want to add this because we think the market needs this. Our mission for the last, call it like six years since we really start becoming a company, it's to power product discovery for large e-commerce companies. And the thing that has defined the new products that we've built since AutoSuggest, so as we added search, as we added browse, as we added recommendations, quizzes, attribute enrichment is a new example that, that we've added. It's all around that mission of, is there something we can do to better power product discovery? What we want to make sure we don't do is go into something that will distract them from being the best product discovery vendor. As an example, we've got some, some competitors that went, that started off in search and then they went into CMS and they went into CEP and things like that. And I'm like, that's a distraction. I don't want to do that. There are people that are really good in CMS. I would much rather partner with them. I don't need to power CMS to do really great product discovery. What I would much rather do is we have one thing that we do. It's product discovery. It's for enterprise e-commerce, for large e-commerce companies. That's it. And if there are places where we can get better there, then we'd love to build them. And so like examples of new things that we've developed there recently and then in terms of roadmap, I think attribute enrichment is a really good example. So it's solving the problem that has existed in search, e commerce search for as long as e-commerce has been around of messy data. Just about every single, not just about, I've never met a company that was like, our data is clean and perfect. I've, just, I've never met that with an e-commerce. Whether you and me both, brother. <laughs> and it, oh, or if they think it's clean, it's not consistent. And you, you may as well not be clean if it's inconsistent. Exactly. And a lot of search companies would, would use that messy data as an excuse. So let's say you're giving back results and the results are not perfect. The excuse would be, oh, the data that those results are based on is also not perfect. And that's why these results are bad. And we're guilty of this as well. And we were thinking about it and we were like, if we really want to be the best, like we don't want to be just marginally better than everybody else, but we really want to be the best, we should take away this excuse from ourselves because the, the excuse, it's a crutch. And yeah. the way to take away that excuse is to say that attribution problem, that problem of messy data, like we're going to handle that too. If you let us handle that, then you don't have that excuse of your data is bad anymore. If your data is bad, that's our fault as well. And so as we're thinking about what to build in the future, it's both everything around product discovery that makes product discovery better. So attribute enrichment being the example, as well as new ways of discovering products. So quizzes, you, you mentioned that as an example before, 
I think there are a lot of exciting developments within generative AI. So new open form queries that people can give, I think that's really exciting. And then areas like dynamic pricing, I think are, are very exciting. Do you show everybody the same price or do you decide dynamically based off of what someone might be willing to buy, what price you should give them? Like who deserves a coupon, who doesn't, things like that. I don't want to share uh, explicit roadmap of, of which of those we're going to start doing. Our philosophy on this is we only start building a new product if we think that everything else is really good. And I think that there's more room to get better at what we currently have first. And I'd love to focus on that. I just think that we've never lost an A-B test, but the amount that we could be winning those A-B tests by, I think is great. If the amount that we're currently winning them by. And so that's the primary focus right now. People trusted us. They, they bought us. We showed them for everybody who ran an A-B test with us. We showed them a lift. I'd love to show them a bigger lift. And do you see any opportunity that is perhaps not being executed on specifically in the B2B side? And I'm thinking of things like, I'm thinking of product configurators and I'm thinking the impact that those have in the B2B world where effectively you've got a composite skew. You've got this one component, you've got this component, you've got this component, and then that results in the final skew that the customer actually adds to their cart based on effectively the variant components that they select in in order to build that thing, right? And so it feels like that data is actually really important from some of the both bundling efforts that the brand does and the way that they put their products together and the way that they create virtual SKUs to achieve that for the customer, but also in the way that you present products to them and perhaps the defaults that, that you recommend to customers, for example, or the the default collections that you create or whatever could be impacted by these really complex B2B configurators. And it feels like that data would be super useful to you. Is that at all sort of something that you've run into that you think might be valuable? Yeah, absolutely. So the variation, uh, and especially the variation that a particular business it has most appealing to them, that's critical data in terms of showing what's attractive. So this is like another one of those things where it's the difference between the holder search systems, the one size fits all search systems that would solve for relevance. For them, this stuff doesn't really matter. They're just trying to show you whatever somebody searches for screw, you show them screws, you're happy. With something that solves for specifically e-commerce, what you really care about is which variations, which mix of the variations is someone actually willing to buy? And how do you show them as early as possible that's something that you have and that's something that you carry? And so keeping track of that data, looking at, I could call it like behavioral data, but it's basically like, what do people configure? And then within the configurations that you show people, which ones do they actually buy? Which ones are they interested in? Which ones do they scroll past? At the end of the day, that data is very similar to, to Clickstream and things like that it helps you decide what to show people that will lead to not just them saying, okay, I searched for screw, gave me screws, and instead showing them screws that they actually are able to buy, they're, they're variations of them that they want to buy, them saying, okay, I'm not just going to give us a thumbs up in terms of relevance, I'm actually going to purchase it. It's actually going to lead to me being a happy customer. I'm going to want to do more of my purchases on e-commerce, and we're not going to need to like call in so many purchases, et cetera, which are all going to be companies. Makes complete sense. And how do you guys make your money? I know that you focus on the enterprise, so I'm assuming that most of your pricing and everything and the deals and the commercials and everything are negotiated based on a combination of how many times your APIs are going to get hit, size of catalog, the number of modules that they implement. I'm guessing it's probably a combination of all of the above, but maybe talk us through a little bit uh, about how you guys make your money and you are a SaaS platform, but how... For a $50 million a year business that has 100,000 items in their catalog and they implement every module in, in the toolkit, what would they typically expect to be roughly paying for your services? Yes. Yeah, so we have a division of church and state at a constructor where I'm much more on the product and technology side. We've got a, a chief customer officer that's much more on the commercial side. I try as much as possible to stay out of it because I'm not good at it. But fundamentally speaking, we think about this in, in, in two ways. One of them is what are our costs and we have to cover our costs. Like we want to build a business that's not just going to be something that relies on VC funding, but it's something that's actually profitable. And of course, that's good for me. Like I build a real business that way, but I think it's also good for our customers because it means there's less risk that 
we wind up being to get acquired in a fire sale or something like that. But then the other side of it, and to me, this is equally, if not more important, it's do we much more than pay for ourselves for our customers? And we, for every single deal that we do, for every single sale that we make, we're always doing the business case beforehand and then we're doing analysis afterwards and we're doing analysis with that customer. Our, our rule of thumb is we want to be making you at least 10x what you're paying us. And if we're not doing that, then we need to fix something because something's wrong. I, I don't want you to buy Constructor because you like the features or because you like the shirt that I'm wearing or what, whatever it is. Maybe our, our AI looks fancy. I want you to buy Constructor because it's a simple math problem. For every dollar that you pay to Constructor, you get $10 back at least. And, and if I can't show you that, then you probably shouldn't be using Constructor. And I made a mistake by selling it to you. And so I want to make sure that never, ever happens. It sounds like then in that case, you've got a very good vetting process in place to pre-qualify potential customers. You know what revenue they need to be doing. You need to, you, you need to know lots about their catalog. You need to know lots about their ops. And can they actually even leverage the platform to its fullest? Because you need, with all of these uh, complex platforms like yours, you're going to need Usually, you're going to need a dedicated merchandiser in the business that can help manage the platform to get the best out of it because it's such a critical part of the customer journey. You need someone that's dedicated to it and they can upskill on the platform, manage and maintain, enhance it over time. And so it feels there's a lot of puzzle pieces that kind of have to be in place with those businesses before you can engage successfully with them. Despite how good your technology may be, there are some factors on the merchant side that have to be there for you guys to be able to guarantee a level of success. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have a process. We spent a lot of time on it it's called the proof schedule. If somebody listening to this is is in B2B and, and they're curious, please you know, reach out to me. I'm, I'm friendly. I promise I don't bite. Hit me up on LinkedIn or whatever. But we spent a ton of time on it. And basically what, what it does is how it works. I'll give you the brief rundown here is we, we get a copy of your product catalog and we put two lines of JavaScript on your website. And those two lines of JavaScript, you, you can do this in different ways, but I'm telling you the simplest one. Basically, what it's doing is it's collecting that behavioral data. So what are people clicking on? What are they adding to cart? Where are they scrolling right past? We do this in a fully anonym, anonymized way. It's GDPR compliant, CCPA compliant. Some of the biggest e-commerce websites in the world's legal teams had to go through this. So we needed to be very careful with exactly how it works. But basically, based off of that data, we're looking at it is what is your product discovery look like right now? How would it look different with Constructor? And we'll show you that. And then with those differences, based off of all of the data that we have at this point over all of the different commerce companies that we work with, what kind of lift can we expect to show you? And we'll show you the math on that as well. So it'll be like, you know, I'll give you one simple example. I remember there was a customer that we had. This is on, on the B2C side, not the B2B side. It's just one that, that stuck in my mind. They sell shoes. And one of the sorts of types of shoes that they sold, it was an Air Force One. And we saw that one of their most popular searches was Air Force One, but instead of spelling it O and E, they would put in the number one and then an S. So like Air Force One's number one S. And when that happened, like all of the results, you could immediately see they were bad. But also when you took the data on it, that search had a much lower conversion rate. It was, if I remember, 20X lower. So about 5% of the conversion rate, somebody spelled it with a O-N-E-S. And so you can just very quickly do the math on it. And you can be like, imagine if all of those people, some, some people will correct themselves and they'll get to the right place. But look at all the people who didn't correct themselves and imagine that they had searched for the right thing. How much money are you leaving on the table there? And then if you add up all of the searches that are like that, what is all that total? To? And if all that totals to $2 that you probably shouldn't use constructor, and you'll see that during the proof schedule. But if all of it totals to $20 million, there's value creation possible here. And we'd love to help with that. Absolutely makes perfect sense. Now, if people want to get a hold of you or get a hold of you guys to find out more, are they best? And I'll put the link into the show notes, but constructor.io are the best to go to the website. Or should they reach out to you directly on LinkedIn, Ellie Finkelstein? How do you like people to get a hold of you? I, either way, you can go to constructor.io. Constructor.com goes to the same place. It's, we, we just never change the name. We own both of them. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn if you want to as well. I like talking to prospective customers. I won't be able to, unfortunately, the company's a little bit bigger, so I won't be able to run you through the whole thing anymore. But reach out to us either way, and we would love to hear from you. 
absolutely amazing, Ellie. We're now at the point of our conversation where I get to flip the script. I get to hand the microphone over to you. I get to let you ask me one question, any question you like, it can be personal or professional. Ellie from Constructor, what is your question for me today? You've spoken to a lot of people working in B2B over many years. I'd, I'd like to believe that I know something about B2B, but I'm, a, I'm definitely a novice compared to you. What do you think that folks like me, what's the number one thing that we miss about B2B? Excellent, excellent question. I think that one of the key things that I'm seeing is that D2C brands on the whole, so I'm talking manufacturers, wholesalers, and distributors that are selling D2C, they don't see what the opportunity is in B2B land. They don't see it. They don't think it's an opportunity that they need to even consider. They don't think of it when they're thinking of channel mix. They just look at it, they put it in the too hard basket. And so therefore they miss out, I think, on the de-risking opportunity of adding the B2B channel. Now, yes, there's unique complexities and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna downplay those complexities of adding. If you've got all the D2C skills in-house and you're used to doing all your digital marketing and that driving revenue as opposed to having any kind of field sales or direct sales teams or anything like that, then yeah, definitely taking on B2B is, I'm not gonna say it's a light lift, but what I would say is that it, it nine times out of 10, almost a year proof of concept, it, it nine times out of 10 can be a significant way to de-risk the rising CAC costs, the issues with economies of scale and product distribution. It, it, instead of all of that falling to you as a D2C brand, then you're sharing those responsibilities. Sure, you maybe make a little bit less margin, but then again, you hemorrhage a significant amount of margin on the DDC side through CAC. So the reality is that usually you can increase your profitability on all of your sales, regardless of channel, by getting better economies of scale and by getting better distribution. And also being able to, at a relatively low cost and complexity, enter new international markets without actually having to be present there with a D2C play, right? And so by working with distributors, say, for example, let's say you're a manufacturer working with a distributor in a new market, sure, maybe you can seed the market on a marketplace in that market. Sure, you could do that. But why wouldn't you let a strong distributor in that market seed the market with your brand because they've already got the distribution, they've already got the routes to the customer, they're already spending money on customer acquisition, et cetera. So I think that's an overlooked opportunity in the D2C space. And I'm pushing real hard on that right now in my content and in the discussions I'm having with a lot of D2C brands, because it's just something that I think D2C brands during COVID didn't need to think about channel mix. They didn't need to think about de-risking their business. The TAM exploded for e-commerce. And if you were half decent at e-commerce, you could be successful during COVID. But now that COVID's coming to an end, all of a sudden, channel mix actually starts to matter again. Efficiency starts to matter again. CAC starts to matter again. Can you be profitable starts to matter again. And so I think this is an area that just doesn't get, it doesn't get a lot of coverage. And I'm aiming really hard to change that. And I think a lot of people working in the B2B space, they discount D2C merchants as a potential pool of B2B customers. But largely, I have discovered that one of the biggest stumbling blocks to D2C brands, even considering B2B, is a lack of tech that's tailored for their brand. And it's a lack of tech that's tailored for the B2B experience. But man, am I seeing that change pretty rapidly with companies like yours and technology like yours that perhaps started out with a heavy D2C, B2C focus, but they're going, man, there's a whole, when we look out across the next decade, the CAGR, the compound annual growth rate estimates for B2B in the e-commerce space are so much greater than the B2C, D2C space. They're going, this is a market we can no longer ignore. We have to think about this for our technology. And therefore, that's a, that is a virtuous cycle because it's making it easier for D2C brands to ad adopt B2B channels. And it's creating more opportunity for the technology vendors as well. I, I see it as a massive win for everybody. I can't agree with that more. I think that Companies like, like mine need to take it seriously. We need to respect that it's different. It's not just D2C all over again with a new flavor. There's significant complexity to it. You have to understand those complexities. You have to respect them and you have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and be willing to lose money even on some of those early customers to make sure that they're successful. But I agree with you that it's a very exciting market. And if I'm putting my data science hat on for a second, I'm allowed to still wear it. Sometimes they let me wear it rarely. I get excited about the problem. Like, I think it's just a fascinating new challenge. 
It is, and there's nothing vanilla about B2B. A lot of D2C is carbon copy design patterns in terms of the tech stack and in terms of the integrations and a lot of that stuff. It's the Shopify, it's the Klaviyo, it's the, it's the, there's almost like a predetermined stack for a lot of new B2C, D2C brands that nine times out of 10, they'll deploy with NetSuite on the back end. And there's this accepted stack in, in large part, whereas in B2B, there is no default stack because these businesses are so different and they're so complex. And that's why I love it as well. I love the fact that I get a challenge every single new B2B merchant that I engage with. It's a new challenge and there's nothing vanilla about it ever. And so that, I, I love that too. I love the fact that, hey, this, uh, it's almost reinvigorated my love for e-commerce because this is now the area where I'm dealing with technical people and operators instead of just marketing people. Whereas on the B2C, D2C side, nine times out of 10, you're, you're engaging with the marketing team because it's a revenue driver for the business, right? And so they drive the scope. Whereas in B2B land, it's tech, ops, and sales. They're the ones that drive the scope for e-commerce. And so it's cool dealing with those type of people. It's, it's cool dealing with people that are in the dirt of the actual operations of the business. I absolutely love that. I think this is why we had such an enjoyable time to act chatting. Absolutely. I can't wait to see you at B2B Online Florida. Ellie, I really appreciate your time and I can't wait to speak to you again soon. Are you a B2B or D2C e-commerce merchant? Then head over to greenwoodconsulting.net to learn how we can help you scale your business.